Avianers. Welcome back to A Taste of Adventure, a six-part series where we're talking to Feast on Chefs about their favorite restaurants, recipes, and local products. Thanks for joining us today through the Avion Collection, an ever-growing catalog of exclusive value, insider tips, and unique experiences just for Avioners. My name is Agatha Pogorski. Through my work with the Culinary Tourism Alliance, I've spent the last 10 years exploring the undiscovered corners of Canada, meeting with chefs, farmers, and artisans, trying to define what makes Canadian food so special. We run a program called Feast On. It's a program that helps chefs source and celebrate Ontario food, and in turn, helps you make better restaurant choices when you visit. Today's guest has worked in the food industry for over 25 years, and he's cooked at some of Canada's best restaurants, but he doesn't really go by chef anymore. Please meet chef, teacher, cookbook author, butcher, and owner of Toronto's most beloved Feast on Certified Butcher Shop, Peter Sanigan. Hello, Agatha. How are you doing? I'm, I'm really great. I'm excited to explore the wonderful, varied world of meat with you today. So much to explore. So much to <laughs> learn about. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to, to, to show you. What's that you have in front of you today? Is that what we're making? This is what we're making. So uh, today I'm going to be braising some short ribs. So the thickness of this particular cut that we're going to braise out today, I cut it to about an inch and a thick, uh, an inch and a half thick. Um, it can be about, it can be an inch thick, uh, two inches. Uh, I like this particular size because after we cut it in between each bone, um, you're going to come out with these nice chunks of, of, of beef, which are really good portions for people. I can eat like two at a time or whatever. So, so yeah, we're going to- I would eat cooking. like four, let's be honest. You're going to eat four. Yeah, well, that's fine. You <laughs> teach their own, teach their own. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to be cooking this now. Again, braising or slow cooking in, in, in simmered uh, uh, liquid. Some people call it stewing. Stewing, I like to think of as, as something you do with like smaller pieces of meat. But braising, you're really bringing the, um, the, the, the tougher cuts uh, you're, you're tenderizing it basically because when it's uh, when you're when it's a working muscle like the brisket, the the neck of the animal, the hips, those tend to be or rather those tend to need a longer cooking time, and that's when you get into things like barbecue restaurants that do briskets and things like that. So, anyways, this particular cut we are going to slowly cook in wine and broth. This is basically uh, and with the ingredients that I have, we're basically going to be doing like a bourguignon style, which is like a, from the Burgundy region of France. It's a, a beef that is slowly cooked. Sometimes it's made with like uh, game meat as well, but it's slowly cooked with red wine, uh, rashers of bacon, mushrooms. It's a really earthy uh, broth that this can be cooked in. Um, and it works wonderfully with a, 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 a tough cut like the... Uh, short ribs it sounds absolutely delicious let's uh let's get into it okay fantastic so the first thing we're going to do um is brown the meat traditionally i would in, in when i was in restaurants i would brown it in a big uh, a, a big rondo or a searing pan or whatever brown it and then kind of work with that in the home kitchen i actually uh, like to brown most of my braising cuts first in the oven and what that does is it, it, it it's less uh, it's a lot easier for the home cook to kind of focus on a bunch of other things while they are, uh, while that meat is browning. They're not worried about splattering or burning themselves with like hot oil. So the short rib, the plate, it's usually a big square. It has four bones. You can see one, two, three, four. We're going to cut these individually in between each bone. So they're about evenly sized pieces of beef. Once they're cut, we're going to get them in a bowl, get them ready to season, and uh, get roasting in the oven. And Peter, is this fantastic recipe found in your fantastic book called Cooking with Meat, recently released? <laughs> um, this one is not, actually. There's a very similar one uh, in there for another cut of beef. Um, but this particular one, no, this is exclusive to, uh, to exclusive you. Exclusive to us? Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, I, when, when I wrote the book, I had to come up with, there's 120 recipes in the book. And um, I feel like I could have easily put in 250. But the publisher was like, no, you got to no. cut it off. I, I actually had to get rid of recipes. 
you can do cooking with me too yeah the sequel the sequel part two <laughs> part two um okay so now i have my uh, uh short ribs cut up into nice even sized cubes i'm just going to season them with a little bit of salt and pepper so i'm just going to do a little bit of oil on that and then um i just take a little bit of tin foil and spread this all out and then pop it in an oven at 450 degrees and that's going to roast in there for about 20 minutes or so maybe 15 minutes well uh well we, we we start doing all the rest of this stuff which are we're going to sweat off some onions and, and bacon together we're going to do uh, add some carrots and celery tomato paste and then mushrooms wine stock it's actually a pretty simple recipe um but it's a delicious one especially in the in the cooler months i guess my next question for you peter is what's it like to have a brick and mortar butcher shop in the heart of one of the coolest communities in Toronto and one of the best markets in the world. It's just, it's like, it's a real sense of community there, uh, a real sense of, uh, of enjoyment of food as well. Um, all the different, I mean, the, the variety of food shops there can attest to that. Honestly, I, I think uh, like we're, we're privileged to have those kind of neighborhoods in Toronto still uh, that makes, makes us have a, a much kind of better life, if you will. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to sound like some like a, a downtown elite hipster dude with all these cool shops around me, but it, but it's true. It makes it makes a much more pleasurable day, in my mind. So um, we're gonna be sauteing some onions and uh, uh, bacon together in um, in butter, a healthy amount of butter. Amazing. Not not unhealthy. Healthy. <laughs> So yeah, like I said, uh, onion and onion and uh, bacon together. We're basically doing a classic European style. And I say European because this, this, these ingredients are very common in, from Italy to Germany, French, French kitchen, French kitchen. You're basically mirepoix. Mirepoix being your onion, carrot, celery, your base aromatics for so many dishes. So yeah, like a, a healthy tablespoon of butter. Get that going. I find cooking um, pork, in this case, uh, you know, bacon and um, uh, uh, onions together at the same time is something I've learned in restaurant kitchens doing uh, like pasta dishes and things like that. It's a really good way of if, if there is going to be a, a, a pork, uh, uh, like a smoked bacon or, or, or cured bacon component in your recipe. Um, cooking it at the same time as the, as the onion is really um, a really great way to render the fat out of the bacon while sweating the onion at the same time and making the whole thing super aromatic. That's the other thing with cooking at home. It's okay to kind of screw up sometimes when cooking from home. Like the, there's only two things that will really ruin food if you're making a recipe. Uh, one is burning it. Like I don't mean make it well done. Like well done is fine. A well done steak. It's not, it, m most people don't like a well-done steak, but if it's good meat, a well-done steak is still fun. A burnt steak, when it's like black and, and charred, is not good. The, that's number one. The number two one is oversalting. And while we like a lot of salt, you still do have to be a little uh, judicious because if you, you can always season it after, it's really hard to take salt away. <laughs> that's true. It's definitely true. <laughs> So my onions and bacon are going to cook together here. I'm going to put a lid on it. So as the onion cooks, it releases water, the water steams and that will kind of, it's, the steam will be contained and that'll help it uh, sweat, do that sweat technique. Like an sweat onion technique. sauna. Like an onion sauna, the best kind of sauna. <laughs> so while that's doing, while that's doing its business, I'm, uh, I'm going to peel my carrots, my onions, or sorry, my carrots, garlic, celery, Get that all ready to go in the pot as well. Chop up some mushrooms. So while I'm doing this, yeah, what else would you like to talk about? <laughs> well, you mentioned earlier that you strongly believe that some of the best meat in the world comes from animals raised right here in Ontario. What yes. do you think makes Ontario so special? I think it's a few things. It's our climate. It's our willingness to experiment and, uh, um, and, and be innovators. We have a great 
like the University of, uh, of, of Guelph, uh, for example, is one of the leading agricultural schools in the world. Uh, so that's a big part of it. Um, like the science, some of the, some of the research in, in genetics for animals that comes out of the Guelph is just, it blows me away. Like I've talked to farmers who have, who, who do like, um, like tenderness tests on their beef using, uh, uh, are those the brothers from VG Meats? Because I've had that tenderness conversation and it is insane. <laughs> it's insane, yeah. So they are, um, uh, yeah, so it's VG Meats and they're a wonderful farming family. Uh, and what they've done is they've kind of bucked the trend of looking for marbling in their beef to looking for tenderness in their beef. And the way they do that is, the, you know, the, the, the very basic way to do that is they'll cut a piece of the loin They'll freeze it. They'll slice it very thin. It's a very, it has, it's a very um, precise measurement. I don't remember what it is. And then they do a pressure test on it with like using a machine to see how, it, and the, how much pressure it takes to cut through the meat. And, and it's like a PSI test that they find out, okay, the, the least amount of pressure equals the most tender. So they don't care. It could be lean, lean, lean. They have no marbling, but, but they're, they're fo hyper focused on the tenderness. That's the kind of thinking that, you don't see in many other places in the world. And this is from, and people don't necessarily even know this about oh, some of our farmers here in Ontario and how they, how they achieve that. Right. Which I find uh, super fascinating. There's a humbleness there. That's um, it's really, it's unique. It's, it's just really fun. The country as a whole is doing pretty, pretty cool things. So is there anywhere in Canada right now that you're looking at from, from your, your butcher's chair in Ontario, just thinking, you know, this is a place I really want to explore. They're doing really cool things right now. Absolutely. Canada for having, you know, a comparatively small population given our landmass has some of the most fantastic uh, things happen in the world of food from like ingredients, like things like, like, like we have, we have ingredients that are priced so priced throughout the world that they're actually shipped to other places in the world before they come to us. Like bluefin tuna, uh, from, uh, uh, from PEI, for example. Um, but yeah, like for me recently, there's a couple of experiences I was lucky enough to have. One was, um, I, I went to Halifax for the first time in, in Nova Scotia for the first time a couple summers ago. And I, I mean, it was, it, it started off as a joke, but I ate lobster at every meal. Like breakfast Me too. <laughs> you have to when you're in Nova Scotia. Yeah. You have to. It, it's just no matter where you go and how it's done, it's so good. It's just so good. So another trip I went on recently that I was really lucky about going on because it was like literally the week before the, the COVID shutdown happened in Ontario. Um, uh, my wife and I were able to go to uh, Quebec City. Like, I, I can't wait to go back. But one of the things I really, really liked is, is the restaurant scene there. And there's a couple of restaurants we went to that are doing really interesting takes on um, either classic uh, French uh, food or techniques. And the one that I really loved was called Pied Bleu. And Pied Bleu is one of a few restaurants owned by a couple who um, focus on traditional French food. And Pied Bleu focuses on charcuterie. It's sweetbreads and foie gras and blood sauces and pâté and pâté and mousses and pork chops and what. And it's just all simple, but so good. I'm just gonna check on that beef again. Well, you can't, it's hard to see <laughs> brown on a black apron. But it's, it's nice and caramelized all over. It's golden brown. I didn't have to splat or do anything on the stove top. It's done. It's ready to go in the pot when we're ready to put it in the pot. So, so far, this recipe looks like everything I want to eat basically always, which I got to say now that I've read your book, Cooking Meat, um, it's one of my favorites, by the way, is true of most of your recipes. How's it feel to add author to your very long list of professional titles? <laughs> It, it, it feels really good, to be fair, uh, or to be honest, not to be fair, to be honest, it feels fantastic. I, I, a book is something I've, I've thought about doing in, in, my, um, uh, in my head for years as a, as a young cook even. I, I liked writing recipes and, and writing down what I was doing, um, and that's in fact where some of the recipes came from for the cookbook. So I, 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 I'm, I'm thrilled that, like, uh, that I'm able to add author to my, um, to my resume, if you will, for that next job that I'm going to get. 
Well, it's a beautiful book and it's full of lo a lot of really great tips like the browning of the shards in the oven, which I was not doing and will be doing forevermore now. Speaking yeah, of tips, right. speaking of yeah. tips though, you did a couple of things while you were talking there. Can you walk us through what you did? Absolutely. So while we were chatting, I casually just uh, uh, put the, the rest of the mirror pot and the mushrooms in the pot to sweat those out to release some of their juices kind of start that cooking process get those flavors going um as soon as in a couple minutes when they're ready to go i'm just going to put the wine and the stock in get that bath going for the beef put the beef in all together and then it's going to go in the oven at 325 and braise or slowly cook for a good uh probably about two hours altogether. uh the good thing about a braise is that what i like to do especially now that i have a family and that um uh my, my wife is a fantastic cook, but uh, I, I end up just being the chef that I am cooking most of our dinners. So I can make this on a Sunday, and cool it down and, and, and eat it on a Wednesday, which, which you know, is really important when you're, uh, you know, you're working on, on Zoom until five o'clock and you just need to <laughs> <laughs> go downstairs and throw something on the stove. So yeah, basically I have all my ingredients in the pot now and I have this beautiful brown beef uh that took about 25 30 minutes in the oven to brown at like 450 500 degrees it's all season to go you put it in and then we're gonna get it in the oven and bing bang boom it's gonna be beautiful in about two hours amazing that sounds absolutely delicious and i wish i was eating it right now i miss dining in restaurants so much probably as much as you miss cooking in restaurants from the sounds of it do you have any tips for bringing that restaurant experience home right now while we're all sitting here? There's a couple things that I like to do. One of them, actually, I made a pact. A pact is a bit of a strong word, but I made a, an agreement, I suppose, with my wife, where uh, we said we're going to start like seriously supporting smaller restaurants in our community. And by that, I mean restaurants that don't normally have food that travels well for takeout. I decided that when the dishes come and it'll be something like, you know, a braised short rib, for example, or a duck confit. When the dishes come, I'll make a concerted effort to, to plate it in a way that I think looks restaurant worthy. My kind of advice for people that want to do a restaurant experience at home is just take the time to kind of create that ambiance. So it's been a little while. Show us this finished bourguignon, Peter. Ta -da! That steam wafting, amazing. So how would you plate up a dish like this? So one of the first things you'll notice is a lot of the, some of that fat's risen to the top. I'm, what I like to do normally with this is I'll set this, cool this down to room temperature, set it in my fridge overnight, and then you can kind of take that, that fat solidifies, you can take it off and discard it and then reheat it uh, for dinner that night. But even coming straight out of the oven, you can see like the, 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 the bone is separating and coming out of the, the, the meat there. You can even take the bone out and serve it boneless if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, this is super luxurious. It's exactly what we need right now to uh, break away from this cold weather we've been having. Um, the wine flavor really kind of comes through the dish. Like you can smell that a bit of that acidity um, and then it's mellowed out by the mushrooms as well. And you can get kind of fancy with this. You can use fancier mushrooms if you want. I, I used uh, uh, just your kind of classic button mushroom for this, but um, I'm always a fan of uh, uh, shiitake or oyster mushrooms if you want with this. Or, I mean, if you really, really are lucky and you can find some porcini or seps, which is basically the same thing, a bolitas mushroom, those add a ton of flavor to a dish like this wanting to replicate that kind of restaurant feeling dish you serve this with like a big piping bowl of like super buttery mashed potatoes or a, a, a smooth polenta or things like this and, and a nice bottle of wine on the table and you're, and you're good to go amazing i wish i was digging into that bowl right now <laughs> yes <laughs> then that through the lens for me peter thank you so much for joining me today this was an absolute pleasure that looks amazing. I'm definitely going to be making that or one of the many other recipes in your amazing book, which I can't stop talking about very, very shortly. Well, thank you very much, Agatha. It's been wonderful to talk to you today. And uh, 
yeah, I look forward to seeing you in the shop. Perfect. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us through the Avion Collection. If you'd like to learn more about Feast On, we encourage you to explore OntarioCulinary.com. And of course, for more Taste of Adventure episodes, head to rbcrewards.com slash Avion Collection.